Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this Red Game Center Com video, we're going to be discussing and analyzing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. And we're going to start things out with a Ryzen 3000 series benchmark that has popped up on the user benchmark database. This is a 12 core engineering sample part, and it's super interesting because we can use this to compare against a Threadripper 1920X. In general, there are three different ways to improve processor performance, and these do fall into some categories. You can increase the number of processor cores for the CPU. You can increase the clock frequency that the CPU runs at. So for example, you could increase the number of cores from six cores to eight cores, or you could increase the actual clock frequency from say four gigahertz to four and a half gigahertz, or you can adjust the underlying architecture to improve the instructions per clock, which is basically the amount of work that a CPU can do uh, per clock cycle. That's the simplest way of it describing it. Now, with the Zen 2 architecture, the IPC is said to improve greatly compared to the original Zen architecture. I'll discuss more about that in just a moment. But let's have a look at the benchmark itself. So we are looking at a part that has already been shown online. In fact, it appeared a couple of months ago, but it is using another motherboard. It's using an AMD QOGIRMTS motherboard and the clock frequency for this is just 3.4 gigahertz for the base clock and is turboing up to 3.7 gigahertz with the older benchmarks that we saw from this same engineering sample it was only using single channel memory running at 2666 megahertz whereas this particular part is once again using dual channel memory running at 3200 megahertz ddr or just 1600 megahertz uh, standard frequency so with the difference here uh, we're looking at about 6% improvement with integer performance floating performance is over 4% and mixed uh, single is 5% improvement as well as latency uh, improvements as well for both 16 megabytes and over 16 megabytes, which is really cool to actually be able to get this nice uh, comparison. Is if you compare the figures here from the uh, Ryzen 3000 service part, which has 12 cores, it is actually outperforming the Threadripper 1920X, which is really interesting because of a couple of reasons. The first is that Threadripper uh, 1920X actually has a slightly higher clock frequency compared to this engineering sample part. And the second issue uh, that in theory should be affecting uh, Ryzen 3000 is the fact that it has dual channel versus quad channel of Threadripper. Naturally, the amount of memory bandwidth required when you go to higher uh, clock frequencies for the CPU core will increase so that you're not uh, memory bandwidth limited, but that's not really going to be a problem here because, well, quite honestly, the memory clock frequency that they're running with this engineering sample is really small. It's, it's rather lackluster. So if this is any indicator, if this is a general indicator of what... Uh, the performance of Ryzen 3000 will be with dual channel memory, I don't think, at least with this 12 core part, it's gonna be that much of a big deal. Don't forget, Zen 2 has numerous improvements in branch prediction, instruction prefetching, plus as well, an improved cache structure. We're seeing a lot, much larger amount of level three cache. It's doubled compared to the older generations of Zen. So this does, along with the IO controller itself, help to alleviate much of the hammering of the memory subsystem, in other words, uh, the DDR4 memory. That's not to say that uh, faster DDR4 memory won't improve things, and obviously as you increase the number of processor cores, along with increasing the processor frequency, I suspect that memory bandwidth will certainly be playing a critical role. In fact, it's going to be really interesting to see just for example, what the difference of running, I don't know, 2400 megahertz versus 3000 megahertz versus say 3600 megahertz and so on would actually do in terms of different processor workloads. Because clearly, if you're running, say, a game, it's going to have a very different uh, workload compared to, let's say, 3D modeling or video editing or, let's say, compiling code and so on. 
or even if you're doing virtual machine work or really hammering things and doing multi-threading, uh, sorry, really multi-tasking. So for example, you could be doing 3D rendering while at the same time as maybe running a virtual machine and having that do something in the background. So these are all different things that are going to be really interesting to figure out what the sweet spot is going to be for your particular workload versus the number of processor cores you've got, how latency and timings are going to impact uh, the performance of Zen 2. Now this also tells us that earlier this year I released a video uh, detailing the IPC of the Ryzen 2000 series up against the Coffee Lake series of processors from Intel. How I did this is very simple. I used a very similar system configuration, albeit uh, with obviously different processors and different motherboards and then I limited the clock frequencies of the CPU to 3 and 4 gigahertz for both Intel and AMD respectively and then run a bunch of applications which would uh, really hammer the CPU cores and you can see that overall Intel do win in a lot of tests but AMD are not that far behind when the clock frequencies are identical. Clearly though Coffee Lake uh, does have a CPU clock speed advantage over AMD but that is looking to change obviously from what the rumors that we've been hearing and the information that I've been fed regarding uh, Ryzen 3000. So as for the IPC gains, uh, Zen to Zen Plus was around 3-ish percent, depending on the application. There were some definite improvements with Zen Plus. The memory uh, controller was definitely one of those, and intercore latency and, uh, and uh, cache latencies were reduced, which did help in some applications. But overall, a couple of percent-ish uh, IPC gain from the original Zen to Zen Plus. Plus, of course, you've got higher clock frequencies compared to, let's say, the uh, 2700X versus the 1700X, which also helped improve performance as well. In the real world, obviously, different applications will uh, hit the CPU in different ways. So I'm hearing that, on average, you're probably going to be seeing around 8 to maybe 10% performance increase compared to the older Zen architecture. But once again, uh, obviously this does heavily depend upon the workload as well as most likely the rest of your system configuration. So it's going to be really interesting to see uh, what workload you throw it at and what type of IPC gains you're going to be seeing. And this is going to be uh, very interesting to test uh, by running the original Zen processor at the very same clock's frequency as a Zen 2 based processor. Ideally, of course, that would be an 8 thread part versus an 8 thread part, although it would be really curious to do this uh, against Threadripper as well. So for example, take a 16 core Threadripper part versus a uh, Ryzen 3000 16 core part and just see how the two applications kind of face off against one another, especially at the same clock frequencies. Shifting things to Intel, we have a couple of Intel pieces of news, the first of which is yet another benchmark for a 10th generation series processor. A short while ago, a couple of weeks ago in fact, we actually did see the first uh, 10th generation benchmark leak. This was uh, on 3D Mark, but since then we now have another. The benchmark is on gfxbench.com and it is of an i5-10-21-0U. That name just simply rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? And the CPU is currently clocked at just 1.6 gigahertz. Obviously, this is not a final retail sample, and it does have an Intel UHD graphics chip within it. This is the very same processor that did appear uh, a couple of weeks ago on 3D Mark. From the links so far, this appears to be Intel's Comet Lake series of processors, and there have been some rumors that there will be variants which will feature a G in the code name. So, for example, it may be that we have a processor by the name of uh, 1035G7, and the rumor has it that this will be the improved graphics core inside the GPU. And I'm going to finish the video off with news of a zombie load, which is yet another security flaw that has been discovered in modern day processors. AMD said that they are not actually vulnerable to this and Intel have issued various statements. So let's go through exactly what zombie load is. So the CPUs which will be vulnerable are any Intel processor which dates back to around 2011 and this will include processors such as Haswell, this will include processors such as Skylake, 
So in other words, there's a very good chance if you have an even semi-modern Intel processor that you indeed will be vulnerable. The worst case consumer workload is said to be about 3%. But the enterprise market is worse than that, up to 9% performance. Uh, so what Zombie Load actually does is it's very similar uh, to how Spectre and Meltdown works. Uh, so what we have here is that you have a hacker which can exploit the vulnerability by having malware on the system. And this can uh, have access to user level secrets, browsing history, website user keys, passwords, and even in some cases, disk level secrets. And this can actually impact you if you are simply browsing onto a website which uh, houses this vulnerability. We'll have to wait until we see uh, the patches go into the wild and a wider uh, gamut of testing, but in the majority of PC clients, according to Intel's test, you are, are only getting a couple of percent hit uh, with an i9-9900K with hyperthreading enabled, but with hyperthreading disabled, uh, which Intel are actually recommending against, then you are looking at up to 9% uh, performance drop, which is quite significant. Data center, though, uh, does get hit harder, uh, particularly in things such as storage testing. And once again, uh, if you have hyperthreading disabled, the performance uh, does drop considerably more versus actually having it enabled. Hosting providers are already getting ahead of this, and actually one of my friends uh, actually used to be a viewer, but now I speak to him quite regularly, so I just consider him a friend. And his particular uh, hosting company, which is DigitalOcean, sent over this particular email. You may have heard about microarchitecture data sampling, MDS vulnerability, also referred to as zombie load, a significant security vulnerability that affects cloud providers, including DigitalOcean. Left unmitigated, this vulnerability could allow sophisticated attackers to gain access to sensitive data, secrets and credentials that could allow for privilege escalation and unauthorized access to user data. Since learning of this vulnerability, our engineering team has been rapidly rolling out mitigations across our fleet. We recommend taking steps to ensure your droplet is up to date and secure. And this is especially important if you are running multiple tenant applications or untrusted code inside your droplet. And then they will obviously continue to update you via their own blogs and emails and that type of thing. As for AMD, they have issued a rather short and sweet statement AMD have said that we are developing our products and services with security in mind. Based on our analysis and discussions with researchers, we believe our products are not susceptible to fallout or zombie load attack because of the hardware protection checks in our architecture, and we have not been able to demonstrate these exploits on AMD products and unaware of having done so. It's really not a good look for Intel, particularly in the data center. I don't think it's going to really affect us as gamers with that, so the i9-9900K, but once again, we're going to have to wait for much greater in-depth testing to know this for certain, but I don't think it's really going to impact the minimum frame rates at a guess uh, based upon the data that they've shown here. Although in terms of cloud, it's really at a poor time for Intel, given they are going to be facing monumental pressure in the data center, thanks to AMD and its upcoming Rome CPUs, uh, which if at least the rumors and what AMD themselves have said so far is accurate, it's going to be a very compelling set of products anyway. So it's going to be interesting to see exactly what this does in terms of shifting of sales figures because AMD were uh, trying to nab around the double digit, like 10, 11% mark of uh, total data center processors. Uh, but obviously this may impact things a little bit and actually increase that somewhat uh, compared to what the original, uh, uh, original prediction had been. Anyway, with all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. If you did, then you know what to do. You can like and subscribe uh, and do all of that shiny stuff. You can also find us down below on the social medias, Patreon, as well as uh, some Amazon affiliate links if you so desire. But with that said, hopefully you've had an amazing day and I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.